Let me ask again. Is it audible? Yes. Okay. <laughs> It's like I've forgotten how to do this. There's one golden, uh, maybe the only technique actually, if there is such a thing, to coming to the recognition of the self. What are we discovering? What is the <coughs> most primal experience? Oh, let's start with saying, what is the most primal, phenomenal experience we can have? That I am. So if this is the most primal experience that we can have, and it's been glorified for centuries as the primordial vibration that has been called Atma, Consciousness, God, all these various terms has been applied to this. Would it be too much to ask whether it is possible to go beyond even this? The sense that I exist is a common substratum to all existence. Do not have the experience of any phenomena unless first I exist. I must exist. And stay with the words that I am using. Because very quickly the mind will try to add on things to what I am saying. And say what I is what. That's exactly what we will look at. But at least this much, we must all be able to agree on by now. But I know that this is undeniable in this moment. Don't go to the web of concepts. But if there's ideas about yourself, you will find that that I exist without any sense of what is after I exist, I am what, that can come later. So if anyone feels, if anyone that is here <laughs> feels that they don't exist, that's a conversation maybe we can have after this one. But let's start with this simple natural presumption that this is the basis of all existence is that I exist. Then the only experience we will have of the self, the self as we refer to as the self, is to find out the source of even this existence. Find out the source of even this existence is a direct pointer to that which we are looking for. If what we are looking for is self-realization or self-recognition. So it's right there. Right there. What is the source of my existence? 
I don't feel like we can get much more direct than this. One or two questions, maybe. So now, if you're noticing your mind is trying to take you on some side track and try to bring your prior knowledge into this, then for some time just allow it to come and go. Don't be bothered with it. Stay with my words as much as possible. What is the source of my existence? Another way of asking this question is to ask, who is the I that exists? Which one is that one that exists? Feel the question in some way. Say, I exist, I am. Which is the I that exists? Don't be quick to jump to conclusions and especially those who have been in satsang. Don't feel like I know the answer. We are not going to rely on any prior knowledge as if it is our first satsang. A question has been asked which is the I that exists? Only thing valuable here is not a concept, but is your insight about this. And even if the mind is resisting with all its might, and these words are sounding like rocket science. But actually, they're very simple words. Or they're sounding completely abstract. Allow these feelings also to remain or to come and go as they might be. Which is the I that exists? Allow this question to percolate your being, to permeate your being. Who am I that exists? and don't have any preconceived notions about what should show up. What does it mean don't have? It only means if some notions of what should show up are showing up, then you just let them go. It doesn't matter if you studied which form of spirituality, 
how much satsang you have attended. All that we have heard or learned, don't bother with it for some time. I am, I exist. Which I is this one? Staying, staying within the framework of this question. Now I'm going to start giving you some clues. Staying within the framework of this question. I'm going to give you some clues. And again, I'm repeating that. Don't add your interpretation to what is being pointed at. Because the words in themselves are potent enough to point you to where they need to point you. We are trying to look at which is the I which exists. So the sense of existence is here. Sense of existence is here. And all that is perceived is moving in front of it. In my being, we can say it's contained within my being or perceived in front of my being. This is just terminology. Don't get confused by it. All that can be perceived is here, moving time, space, light, sound, gravity, everything is here. What we are looking for is what is, what is on this side. 
So for this, this side can be allowed to move in its own way for some time. Allowed to move in its own way for some time. But the exploration is what is that which is on the other side? What is here? So this is what we are looking at. This in the middle of this illustration is the sense of my existence. I am. The nature of the mind is such that it can only report on that which is moving on this side. What is on the other side, it cannot fathom. It cannot fathom. So you know that the mind will not be able to help you coming to a recognition about this. It might offer you a concept about this, but truly can't help you with a recognition or insight about this. This insight has to be more primal. It has to be more direct without the interpretation of the mind. So if you lift the veil of phenomena, is there nothing else to I is there nothing else to I if we keep all phenomena away? And as I was sharing last time, a simpler way to look at the same exercise is you put everything that you perceive in a basket called seen. Everything that you perceive, you put it in the basket called seen. I see this, so it goes into the basket. I see the world, so it goes in the basket. I see the body, goes in the basket. I perceive my breath, goes in the basket. I perceive my thoughts, emotions, goes in the basket. I perceive, or I am aware of even the sense that I exist. So even this goes in the basket. So now, are you completely inside the basket? Partly inside the basket? Or not inside the basket at all? Very simple exercise. Everything that you see, put it in the bag or basket of seen. What is left outside the basket now? Some of you might be having now the experience of your non-phenomenal self. When all the dynamic aspects of yourself have been put in the basket. And the impulse sometimes can be that I need to hold on to this. <laughs> the impulse sometimes can be I need to hold on to this. But instead of that, today you try to put this or jump into the basket. Even that which is aware of every phenomena, can you put that also in the basket? Jump in completely and see if there continues to be an awareness, a witnessing of this basket in spite of all your attempts to jump in.
can you be contained in this phenomenal bucket or is there the greater aspect of you and greater also i know is a special term so doesn't fully apply but you get the essence of what i'm saying does the source of all phenomena itself get fully contained in the phenomenal basket so now we looked at two clues isn't it we looked at the first clue which is to say that everything that is perceived all phenomena is on this side can we look at what's on this side and another way of looking at the same thing was to use the basket metaphor and to say that if everything that is perceived can be put inside this or encompassed in a label called seen is there something which cannot be encompassed in this label let me give you one more clue and so i fix this table and this one you heard from me before the sense that i exist some of you are still struggling to find the sense of existence and it seems just like a mythical entity right now or something you know my favorite question for this is to try and stop being can you not be right now in your attempt to not be you will encounter your own being presence which is just present the being which is just being consciousness itself there are two ways to approach this question the first way when i say can you stop being the first way you could do is you could say no of course not what kind of question is that i can't stop being is it? and that is just a mental answer the second way to approach this question is to actually make this attempt to not be don't be for an instant don't exist and you will notice your own being your own presence the data police is here maybe so you are now aware of your own presence that's why you see i can't stop being being is just here so when this answer comes from a place of insight then it is a useful answer so now the third clue is which one is aware even of this being what are the attributes of this one what are the qualities what is the flavor what is the size or shape of this one that is now so naturally effortlessly aware of your existence
again it is not about the reporting it is not about the right answer it is to use these questions to come to a direct insight about the unchanging self as you are asking yourself these questions you might find that something starts fluttering on the phenomenal side it could be the mind it could be some emotions it could be some story it could be the body it could be your outside environment so let all of these things just come and go consciousness itself has the power to do this it is only playing as if it needs this direction so whatever has to jump around on the phenomenal side of it we we'll let that jump around with no sense of impatience or rush but you stay with the question what is aware of my existence for some of you the mind might be screaming and saying there's nothing there there's nothing there what's this about is it not enough to just know it is nothing actually no to know it is nothing is to actually be in denial of it
because the idea of nothing is that it's like an empty glass, the absence of phenomena. What you will discover about yourself is that this is a full nothingness and yet without attributes and qualities. I completely realize that these words don't make any sense to the mind. And yet, as you come to the recognition of this, you will know what I am pointing to. Because although it is empty of quality and attributes, it is not the nothing of the empty room or the empty glass. It is the no thing which is the source of all things. It is the source of your own existence. It is self-aware. The source of existence implies the source of all intelligence. The source of all that can be conceptualized, that can manifest, is your own self. Don't fall for the concept of nothing, although it is nothing. So come to the insight about this nothingness, which is the self. On which side of I am does consciousness want to play now? On which side of I am does consciousness want to play? This does not mean, by the way, that once the recognition is available once the recognition is made about the source of existence it doesn't mean necessarily that the play of existence will stop or reduce the play of existence can continue In fact, it truly becomes a play only when there is a recognition of the source. Till then, it, as much as we like, it doesn't truly seem like a play because it can seem like I am a phenomenal entity contained in this phenomenal world and therefore can be attacked, hurt, affected by the phenomenal appearance and the disappearance. Once you see that yourself is the source of all phenomena, and yet at the same time remains untouched and unchanging by any phenomenal movement, then you will start to enjoy this like a play. Also, the mind can come with a trick and say, this means that I must be in denial of phenomena. In fact, we are saying the opposite. Be completely inclusive of all phenomenal appearances, but just look beyond 
don't have to push away any phenomena. Include them in your experience. But also look beyond. And how to look beyond the three simple pointers that I shared today already. So this is the direct path to the recognition of the self. And most of you having been in satsang, and since this uh, link for today was shared only with those who have mostly been in satsang with me for some time, most of you have had insights about this. Direct insight of the self is not something, it seems like a abstract concept or something un unachievable for most of you. So all of satsang, all of this sharing is actually meant just for the transcendence of the limited idea we have about ourselves. As we are coming to the discovery of that, which is prior to all phenomena, which is not constrained by any boundary, we are realizing ourselves to be that which is prior to even consciousness. Consciousness itself coming to the recognition of its own source. In its play of delusion and self-recognition is all that is happening now. So as you are coming to the recognition of the self, the mind will continue to make offerings to you, pointing you back to your limited nature, reminding you that you are a limited entity after all. In spite of your recognition otherwise, the mind will continue to make these appeals to you and come up with things like, yes, it is okay for satsang, but what about the real world? It wants to convince you that the limited self actually took birth and you are that. Subtly or blatantly, in most messages, from the mind is contained the story of our limitedness. And in this story, you are a limited entity trying to get to the self. That, will, that is why the recognition of what you are right now is important. You see, because no matter what the life circumstances might be, what the age of your body might be, anything, what the quality of your emotions might be, which kind of thoughts might be coming to all of us, 
in this room and online the insight about the self is the same therefore this must be unchanging the self is ever present even more than ever present actually because presence itself is subject to the self it is your limited ideas about yourself and when i say your limited ideas this is just consciousness referring to consciousness itself consciousness playing with ideas of limitations posing as a limited entity posing as a person posing as if it is just the mind in this leela that is being played so satsang is nothing but these two aspects which are completely interlinked which is the recognition of what is truly here what is it that i truly am even before i am and how is it that i pose as if i am something which is limited how do i pose as if i am personal and the dissolution of this belief in this <coughs> idea of limitation is interlinked very strongly with the recognition of the self and the recognition of the self is interlinked with consciousness giving itself the space for this recognition by not believing itself to be what the mind is saying that is why the recognition of the self and the letting go of limited concepts letting go of our thoughts are the two main aspects of direct satsang in this way now it is up to you as consciousness how will you pose next will you pick up a pose or will you continue to remain with your insight about what you are and consciousness is completely free it is more amusing and ludicrous to presume that you are an entity playing on this side of your existence you see like a body mind entity or whatever terminology you want to use and more natural actually to see that you are that which is aware even of this existence and that is why consciousness has given itself this divine hypnotizer called the mind which is convinced as for most of our existence that i am just a small entity playing on this side of my existence that which can be perceived and so strong is the hypnosis that the question to really check what is the basis of my existence who am i really who is the i that is existing seems like a very rare question 
And if you look at all of our lives, you'll see that due to some grace, this question came into our lives. If your mind is saying, I haven't understood anything. <laughs> I've been sitting here for one hour and Ananta, you've been speaking and I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Don't worry about it. As Guruji says, then the good way to look at it is that we have bypassed the mind because you're still here. Yeah, we lost connection for a minute there. Is everything still good? Audio, video is good? Earlier, I've often called the sense of existence a portal, a portal which goes both ways, which is a portal anyway. <laughs> so on this side is this entire phenomenal play of emotions and thoughts and stories and life and family and relationships. And I'm not saying that they must vanish. Attention can also go to it but just a little bit of attention to what's on this side of the portal. Just a little bit of looking as to the source of this I am. What is the I in I am? I know all of you have been satsang long enough to hear this question. What is the I in I am? Why is it I am and not you are? You say, I'm aware of the sense of existence. You see? 
It's almost objective in a way, isn't it? I'm aware of this sense of existence. So why don't we call it, oh, you are, oh, presence, you are. Why do you say, I am? We are aware of it. And yet, what do we call it? I am. How come it is I? Even if the questions don't make sense, it's okay. Let them, let them get land somewhere. How come it is I? This I is actually a much maligned word. Especially in spirituality. <laughs> you have maligned it completely and said, I, I, I is the ego. I like very much when Guruji explained that this I is actually just a label. It's a chameleon I. Thank you. It's a chameleon I, which is used for the entire spectrum. He says, the devil says I, and God says I. What it means? The mind posing, the poser, the voice of limitation, the ego, says I. We use the label I for the body also. We use the label I for our feelings, I am feeling, for our thoughts, for any sensations. We use the label I for I am. And we use the label I for that which is the source of I am. We also use the label I for our attention. Many times in satsang this happens. You say, it is completely clear with you, sitting with you, it's so clear. But I get stuck in some tendency, or I get stuck in my relationship. I get stuck. Which I get stuck. Many times we are referring to our attention. I get stuck with my thoughts. Referring to our attention also as I. This I is a label. But what is the truest I? Which is the I to which I cannot say not this? Like most of you know about the practice of neti neti. Just like we say, seen, seen, seen. I see it. I am the witness of it. I am the subject, not the object. So not this, neti. I see this. I am the subject in this, not the object. Neti. Not this, not this, not this, not this. Does there come a point to which we cannot say not this? That point is where this is no longer phenomenal. And yet it is still I. So actually this is the fourth clue. It's all the same actually. But sometimes we need various approaches to get to the same thing. What is it that we cannot say, not this? It is so originally, inherently I that when we ask the question, who is aware of this? It points to this itself. It is so originally and inherently the self, I, that when we ask the question, who is aware of this, it points back to itself. This is the point at which you are coming to the non-phenomenal recognition of yourself. Some of these words that I'm saying today, as I'm hearing them also, I feel like it will be very nice if you read them. Because if you hear them, it might seem like it's just a bunch of words and they seem a bit complicated. But if you read them at your own pace, slowly looking at that which is being pointed to, then you will see the simplicity of them.
So I'm saying, if you ask who is aware of the computer, so it takes us beyond the computer. Who is aware of this body? It takes us beyond the body. Who is aware of thoughts? It takes us beyond thoughts. Who is aware of emotion? It takes us beyond emotion. Who is aware even of existence? It takes us beyond existence. Who is aware of this awareness? This is the point. It takes it back to itself. This is a self which is unshakable, unchanging, unborn, undying, un-everything, unlabelable, <laughs> un-everything. It would be really nice if uh, those who are feeling interested can actually read the words and follow along at your own pace, digesting all of the pointing. Take your time over it. A couple of questions before we disconnected, so I don't see them now. If those who ask can just type it again, I can have a look at them. Okay, Rahul, Rahul is here. Rahul says, Apologies that mic isn't working, but if it's okay, my question is, how will the Advaita teaching help when the temptation or pull to indulge in addictive behaviors is just too strong? How will the Advaita teaching help when the temptation or pull to indulge in addictive behaviors is just too strong? Usually I say that I give or whatever responses that come from here are on the basis of direct experience. So let me not presume that I understand exactly how it must be to have this kind of addictive behavior. But I can point out one addictive behavior which is common to most of humanity, if not all of humanity. And that is the primary addiction, which is an addiction to our thoughts, addiction to the mind. It might seem like it is not that harmful. It might seem like it is light. It is not too bad. But the minute someone is asked to let go of this mind, to be empty of it, many or most experience withdrawal symptoms. Wanting to rush back to a concept because it feels too open and naked to not know. To not know in the sense of to not mentally know. To not have a conceptual position. Even right now, just notice about yourself as you're hearing this answer. How conceptual position would be getting formed over there. You see, either in, in support of this kind of answer or in opposition to it. Now what we are talking about is the neutrality which is neither for or against. This is the not knowing which allows the truest knowing to emerge. And this knowing is a very strong addiction because even for a few moments as we are left without a conceptual position, it can seem too open and many experience a lot of fear because of it. So although openness or to remain open or allowing or neutrality 
or emptiness. All these might seem like very simple ideas. But as you start to taste your openness, your neutrality, you find this addiction to a mental concept about yourself. It can be the popular concepts like, oh, without the mind, without knowing anything, how will you live? How will you pay your bills? What if you become a serial killer? What if you just lie in bed all day? These are the most popular ones, isn't it? And I need the mind. Without the mind, the God cannot run this life, is it? But they can be also very subtle. Is it? And especially for those who are in satsang, our spiritual positions become very strong. I would much prefer it that we don't even call this Advaita. <laughs> because even that can become a position, you see. What if we just say we are just speaking from experience? This is not a form of teaching. Although I have nothing against Advaita, but I'm saying that the subtlety of taking positions is this, you see. It's like this. So we allow the dropping of all reference points to ourselves on the basis of any mental knowledge. In my experience, at least this has been the strongest addiction. And many who have been to satsang have also confirmed this. With this mind, has been the strongest addiction of consciousness. That's why even Guruji sometimes says, this is a rehab for God himself, that God himself is running. Consciousness itself seems to have got addicted to its own creation called the mind and has also designed this, all the spiritual paths and satsangs for the rehab from this. Why is it a rehab? Because if it is not an addiction, I would need to have only one satsang, actually. <laughs> you have one satsang, and it will be clear. You see, the mind is talking about some limited entity that does not exist. Boom, finished. <laughs> the fact that we had more than 1,000 now is because of the persistence of this mental addiction. We know that this conditioning doesn't drop off so easily because everything can become a condition. Even our spirituality, even the pointings which are heard, even a statement like I am awareness can become a position if it is just taken mentally. Or I am consciousness, I am that, any. So because the mind also derives its smartness or sneakiness or cheekiness from the supreme intelligence of consciousness. It is a divine hypnotizer. And that is why we come to satsang over and over again to look through these tricks of the mind, look through all the specialness and arrogance Because for the mind, actually, the openness of not knowing is maybe even worse than death. So it resists it with all its might by giving you some concept to hold on to. Again, I apologize because I feel that your question was not so much about the mental addiction, it was about the addictive behavior. But I hope it helped in some way. Okay, somebody is in a rush. Dr. Sundaram has a question he can ask. He can unmute his mic if it's working. Namaste, Namaste, sir. Namaste, Guruji. Namaste. I am Rajiv. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Namaste, you know. 
how are you doing uh, i just wanted to ask you a very practical down to earth question uh, so, sometimes when i am going inward uh, you know the the bodily attachment reminds it finally boils down to feel as if body is the end of it but the ultimate uh, the uh, the important uh, notion is one should be uh, uh, one should get rid of this body and mind thinking in the in the whole mechanism of the whole process but how, can you please help me tell how do i get rid of this nonsense body totally from the final stage and be in the inward inward looking stage without any trace of bodily attachment I have finished. I, I have concluded asking you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. In fact, uh, we looked at this a little bit even earlier. So let me read the whole book. When I said that the dance on this side will continue, and our approach is not to try and push it away, but to have an inclusive approach to it, not to be in denial of it. You see, have an inclusive approach to it. I have to be honest and say that I have met people in this life. Met anyone who is completely free, completely free from body attachment, and it is definitely not the case here. Also, so sometimes the hundred percent idea becomes a bit, and you can be free. And the way you called it nonsense, I saw that there is a sense of aversion about it. You see. The sensation of the body are here, and because it feels so intimate, my advice would be not to try to push them away, to include them in your being, to include them in your seeing, and yet try to look and see what is there which is beyond this. <laughs> Where are the symptoms? That sound, this sound, and the sensations of the body, are they appearing in two different spaces? Are they appearing in different spaces? when i start contemplating and looking inward and uh, i am able to i am able to be in a, a no thought stage okay and then finally when i come to the stage i mean and then when i go to the next step saying okay i am able to be in a state without any thoughts and i am able to watch then when i look at that who is the who is watching the all these all these events sometimes i get uh, stuck at the body level me 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 my body you know so that it is the final stage sometimes it's not always during during sometimes in a in a in a actual contemplation state i get that kind of thing but the yeah. whole purpose of the inward looking is getting defeated by that i feel very frustrated actually many times in that way i would I like understand. to get rid of this honestly i understand your frustration that's why i'm suggesting that okay let's do this together and see at which stage both of us get stuck huh? the proof of the pudding is in the eating so let's see if we can do this together and that which you call defeated let's see if the sensations of the body make something defeated or take us away from the inquiry so for some time don't try to push away the sensation of the body in fact experience it fully whether it is your arms your legs your chest your head any part of the body allow yourself to experience it is this the extent of all the phenomenal experience that you can have right now no 
you will see that even this voice that is being heard coming from the mouth of a seeming ananta is also experienced. The other sounds on the roads, all, if you open your eyes, then a lot of this phenomenal content also experience. My advice is to let all of this be, including the body. Now the question is asked, what is it that is aware of all of this? So then, when the sensation of the body seem to come up and the mind says, this is me, ask yourself, who witnesses both this sensation and the testimony from the mind saying it is me? Find out who witnesses this. So then instead of it seeming like a defeat, the appearance of these sensations can add fuel to the self-inquiry by allowing you to focus on something and ask the question, who is the witness of that? And you will notice about the mind especially that as you allow it to come, then it runs out of moves. If you keep resisting the mind, then it can seem to be very troublesome. So if you tell the mind, okay, what all do you want to say? Tell me 10 things right now. <laughs> then it will run out of things to tell you very quickly as you are open. But if you say, don't speak, don't speak, mind, mind, keep quiet, keep quiet. I say, hello, hello, it will keep coming, you see. <laughs> so, if you can make this little bit of switch in approach and allow all movement to happen, then we are not concerned whether the room is quiet or noisy, whether thoughts are coming by the dozen or the mind is quiet, whether strong sensations are there, everything that is coming. As Bhagavan advised, to ask, what is it that witnesses this? And the more it comes, the more it is the opportunity to ask this question. Nothing can defeat you because the witness is unchanging. It is the mind stick itself which says, this should change and then I'll be able to do the inquiry. My position with respect to the body must change and then I will be able to inquire. My thoughts should reduce and then I'll be able to inquire. All of these are also tricks from the mind only. Because the self is not going anywhere. So instead of using these as obstacles, you use these as opportunity. A strong sensation is there in the body. See, what is it that witnesses this sensation? Is that also a sensation? What is the most primal sensation? It seems to be the sensation of being. What witnesses even that? So as you are open, as you are allowing, then all of these which seem like big obstacles because of our conditioning actually, it is because of spiritual conditioning where we've heard that body must be set aside, Ego must be killed, you see, these kind of things. So then they become the conditions. But I'm saying that without condition, allow everything. And just look at what witnesses that. So again, I know, I'm sorry, I said we do it together, but maybe I went too fast. <laughs> No, 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 it was perfectly all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I got a very big, uh, very useful clue from you. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So before we close today, uh, maybe we can re request Radha to sing us a song from her new 
recording. She's made just made a recording in Sahaja and come back. So maybe she can sing something for us. Yeah. You're good. <laughs>
love you all so 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 much thank you thank you so much for being in satsang today sadguru shri moji ji ki jai shri I know that some of you are going to Sahaja now. Jyoti is going, Nitya is going, maybe some others also. Take all our love, take all our pranams to Guruji and the Sangha family there. I don't know how to stop. <laughs> stop it, dear. Yes. <laughs>